The views and opinions expressed by Chair Susan McRory are those of Mrs. McRory's and do not represent the views of the Alberta Provincial Government. Welcome to the queues for quasi-judicial boards on the political trenches, local government at work. Today, we are honored to be sitting down with Susan McRory. Susan spent 20 years as Alberta's chief environmental prosecutor. During that time, she helped develop and grow the province's system of creative sentences for environmental offenders. Prior to her work in the environment, she was a full first full-time female crown prosecutor north of Edmonton and the first woman appointed as chief crown prosecutor west of Ontario. Leaving Alberta Justice in 2013, she served as a member of the Environmental Appeals Board of Alberta, a public member with the Association of Professional Engineers and Geoscientists of Alberta. And in 2018, Susan became the board chair of the Land and Property Rights Tribunal, which has just been recently renamed in the province of Alberta. So with that, Susan, welcome to the Political Trenches. Thank you so much. So before we get underway, I, I know you just have a brief little statement you want to make, so that way our listeners and viewers know where you stand before our interview gets underway. Yeah. just want to make it really clear that I'm not going to be talking about specific cases, and I'm not going to be talking about the direction that the tribunal may or may not take, because that's not fair. But I can talk about process, and I hope I can provide some information that will be of assistance to your listeners. Thank you so much. So I, I want to start with sort of a bit of an educational question, if you will, because uh, I, I'm coming into this a little bit green. Ian may know a little bit more about this issue than I do, but can you briefly explain to myself and to my list, our listeners, what exactly is a quasi-judicial tribunal or board in the province of Alberta? Okay. Hint, <laughs> quasi-judicial. Okay. It means sort of like a court. We're actually almost, I like to call it almost a halfway house. When there are decisions that need to be made, you can go to the court or you can go to your political uh, masters and ask that that decision be made. But there's thousands, millions of disputes that are out there. And many of them are not appropriate for the courts because the courts are expensive and sometimes inaccessible. And there are thousands and millions of disputes that politicians don't have the time and don't want to make the decision on because the decision is something that's not going to make anybody happy. So we're, uh, we are one of the tribunals, but this idea that there are quasi-judicial tribunals out there is 150 years old. Hmm. This isn't a new thing. It's just we are the tribunal that uh, deals with decisions that makes decisions on various statutes that have been given to us to deal with. So we, uh, we're we looking specifically at the Land and Property Rights Tribunal and, and its relationship to local government here in Alberta and beyond. How does the tribunal fit within kind of that realm? You mentioned the, the judiciary, you've talked about the legislature. How does it rel relate then to local government as well? Again, we're sort of in the middle. Okay. When there's disputes between, let's say, two municipalities under the Municipal Government Act, it's called, uh, that is a dispute that comes to us for a decision. If there's a dispute about annexations, again, between two municipalities, that's a matter that comes to us. I think your uh, listeners will know more about what's on the uh, municipal government side of the fence. Sure. They'll also know that if there's a dispute as to the valuation of a commercial building, like the one that I'm sitting in, that the tribunal sends a presiding officer to decide on those assessment matters. Um, your listeners may also be familiar with what we call designated industrial properties or DIPs, that's how we call them, where there's a fight between what is the assess assessed value of a major industrial facility. Again, we are the decision makers there. I mean, I don't wanna have a sound fancier than we are, but the better comparator is we are more like judges because within the area of work that has been assigned to us, we decide and our decisions are final 
unless overturned by the courts. So with that in mind, then, what sort of authority do you as a quasi-judicial board have to enforce your decisions? That's a different matter. It, like okay. the court, exactly. If you go to small claims, you may get a judgment. It's up to you to do the enforcement. Okay. Same thing in the court of King's bench, exactly the same. And the court, a judge-like function, should not be involved in the enforcement side of the fence. That would be improper. I want to talk about the makeup of the board, if that's okay for a second, because um, I, I think of a tribunal, I think of a judge, right? I think of someone sitting at a, the front of a courtroom, and not that I have experience with it. I'm not saying I do. I'm just saying that I, I, that's how I, I picture Good. it. <laughs> Thank you. Can you can you explain to me and the, sort of the myth of what a quasi judicial tribunal might be is a court system, but it's not right. It's members of the general public who are appointed by the provincial government. Correct. Yeah, but that's what judges are too. That's exactly what judges are. We're hmm. different in that we don't have tenure, so that it is we are uh, appointed at Her Majesty's pleasure, or sorry, His Majesty's pleasure. It's hard to remember that yeah. now. But yeah, we do not have tenure, but and we apply to be appointed to the board just like you would uh, applying for any kind of government job. The folks who do sit are experts in their own fields. Um, this is not like you're a public member where you're offering oversight, you're offering an opinion, sort of in an advisory capacity. We are decision makers. And so we need to be experts in our respective fields. And that's typically engineering, law, architecture. Uh, we, have, um, we have several folks who are experts in the municipal government governance side of the fence. We have teachers, we have ranchers, we have a turkey farmer, we have uh, uh, grain farmers. So it's important that the tribunal have this broad base of expertise. And these are people that are experts in their field. These are not uh, people of, you know, these are people with a long history in their area of specialization. It sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but it sounds like anyone can apply to sit on a tribunal, if I'm not mistaken, as long as you, as long as you have an expertise in a certain issue. Uh, absolutely. You know, there's, and we do have people, we have PhDs, and we have people that have high school uh, degrees. That's, it, it's a broad range. Well, what's more important is ex long experience in a particular field. That's what's very important. And the other very, very critical thing is that they be good writers. But I think people do not realize every single one of the thousands of decisions that we write every year must be in writing. And it's not somebody else holding the pen. It is the member who writes the decision. One, so one the last... combination, sorry. Sorry. No, I was going to have one last question before I, I, I hand it over to Ian there, just on that statement alone. Um, is there a need for people to be appointed to be on sitting on tribunals like the Land and Property Rights Tribunal? Or is there an abundance of people already applying for this? Because I, I didn't know until you and I had that pre-interview uh, that you guys were appointed and anyone could apply. So are people actually wanting to sit on tribunals like yours? Yes. Yeah. And we have recruitment um, on a, you know, as an as needed basis. And the recruitment always depends on what is the work that's coming in the door, because we don't have control over that, but we have to respond to it. And so if there is a huge number of increased applications in a certain area, the recruitment is going to be targeted to experts in that particular area. Hmm. I'm going to follow up on that one, if I might. You mentioned the panel a couple of times, which to me indicates there's more than one person on this entity at a time looking at a particular topic or subject. How do you decide how many people would comprise a panel and whether you're the type of expertise you'd be looking to on that panel? Um, you can have a one-person panel. Okay. You can have a three-person panel. And on major um, hearings, we have a five-person panel. 
And it's a question of what does the file require? What does, what's needed? If it's a, 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 what we call a written hearing, then perhaps only a one person panel would be sufficient. And that's of course the fastest panel of them all because there's only one person. And so high volume um, cases would typically be referred to a one person panel. That typically, um, anytime you're applying for rental compensation, it's probably before a one person panel. If you are applying for an increase in your annual payment, almost universally a three person panel. Most of the hearings, the, whether they're in person or virtual, are before a three person panel. Right now, we have a five person panel dealing with a designated industrial property appeal that is, I think, in its seventh or eighth week of hearing. Wow. So obviously, when it's a very, very long hearing, I want to be sure that we don't lose anybody because of illness. And of course, just the work is so extraordinary that it is of assistance to have it shared with five folks as opposed to three. I assume it's not a coincidence that they're all odd numbers. Is this a, is this a, like a majority decision? Like a. No, um, but it, it has to be an unequal uh, number. We do have the ability for a dissent. It is you have a three person panel, two people can decide one way and the, the third person has the ability and if appropriate to write a dissent. It's very much the court of appeal works exactly the yeah. same way. Okay. And how, I mean, you mentioned uh, several thousand cases this year. Are you seeing caseloads increase or reduce? I, mean, I think you also talked about this being now a combination of other previous quasi-judicial boards as well. So what's happening yeah. with that? The number of applications are going through the roof. Um, on one area within surface rights alone, this is just surface rights, one kind of application. I think we had 6,100 applications last year. Surface rights generally about 7,000 applications. Now that includes the 6,100. So we have a tremendous increase. Uh, we also do um, subdivision appeals, roughly 40 a year. But two years ago, we acquired jurisdiction for subdivision and development appeals, doubling the workload in that area. Wow. Um, on the assessment side, it's very variable. It's really rich, so much tied to what the economy is doing. And mm -hmm. on the commercial assessment side, the numbers have gone down. We used to have about a thousand hearings a year. I think this year we're at 700, something like that. But on the designated industrial property side, I think we went four years without any hearings. And now we're in the biggest hearing I think the tribunal has ever had. And going forward, there's a number of files that are in the hopper, so to speak. So mm -hmm. it changes and you have to be aware of those changes and respond to it in the recruitment. I, I'm gonna ask the very stupid question right now and I apologize for this, but <laughs> when does the tribunal get involved? So what is the process from someone having an issue to when you get involved. And I, I apologize if I ask it that way, because oh. you talk about the SDAB. I'm like, Hey, I sat on SDAB for like two years and I had no appeal. So I didn't really do anything for it, but yeah. how does a, an issue get to your desk? And yeah. what is the process where you have to say, okay, this is land and property rights tribunal board material, or this is for another quasi judicial board material because i think there might be a misconception because i'm gonna i'm not gonna lie I, th I thought it was just like another justice system where people just get sued and they go in front of you but it sounds like that's not the case <laughs> and it, you know I, i'm sorry you asked me to stay sit steady i could go and get my my legislation and throw, <laughs> wave it in front of you that's the point it's in the legislation that's how things get to us. And it depends 
what piece of legislation you're talking about. You said you're more familiar with the subdivision. That's under the Municipal Government Act. Mostly when we're under the Municipal Government Act, we're dealing with appeals. Somebody else has made a decision at a lower level and one of the parties isn't happy with it. And they come to us as the appeal authority saying somebody lower down made a mistake, yes or no. So if you had a subdivision, it, Chris, if you had been uh, sat on a panel and had made a decision as a local subdivision and one of the parties objected to it, the matter if it had a provincial impact would come to us. We don't do them all. We okay. couldn't do them all. That would be impossible. But where the impact has an effect beyond the local community, it comes to us. Surface rights is different. Surface rights is a trial. It's a trial in the first instance and where the parties are, they apply, whether it's to get compensation, whether to increase the compensation, um, whether to claim for damages. They apply and they come to us. And you make a really good point. We have to decide, is this something that is within our jurisdiction to do, yes or no? That is the first and primary directive question that we have to consider each and every time. Because we're not in charge of the universe. We're only in charge of our part of it. Now, the word quasi-judicial seems like a very big terminology, but you you, you kind of simplified it right now uh, in, a, in an earlier statement. I'm going to ask a poignant question here, and I, I want your honest, and I think I've gotten honest to you, and if we've gotten honesty out of you for the last uh, 20 minutes so far. One would hope. <laughs> what, what is the biggest misconception that you see as the chair of a quasi-judicial tribune that you want to rectify and clear up right here, right now. So that way our listeners who are traditionally in the municipal realm would understand a little bit better of what you do and what you don't do. We are not an advisory board. We are not a governance board. Most people are familiar with that sort of a board and that's what they think we are and we're not, we make decisions. We make decisions based on evidence. We're governed by the rules of natural justice and our quality control is the court. Hmm. So this is not business as usual. It is a judging job and being a judging job it's very, very different than what people are used to in their regular life. It's very rewarding. But I think the, the misconception is I can bring to the table what I brought to the table in my other career. It requires a complete change in approach. Hmm. The tribunals we have, we're speaking in Alberta, of course. Are, is it a similar system across the country or is Alberta unique in some fashion with its use of these quasi-judicial boards? Not at all. As you see, it's, we've been doing this for 150 years. What is different is each tribunal may have a different mandate depending on what its legislation is. And it has a different level of formality and a different level of whether it's a purely uh, inquisitorial or whether it's really like a court system or it's, um, it's a fight between the parties. And it depends. It is the importance of the issue that determines how formal and how much the procedural rules apply. So if the matter is, you know, I can't think of a, let's say your local hockey rink. Um, there's an issue about uh, what time it opens and what time it's, it closes. You might have a tribunal that will decide that. Is that a major issue? Not particularly. It's an important issue, but 
there's an informality because you do not want to make your process so formal that it becomes inaccessible. Sure. What do you see then about the future of this as a process? You, you it sounds like there's an evolution that's been happened that's happened in Alberta recently with the combination of several boards, uh, tri different tribunals. Are you seeing uh, this becoming a, a more used, or do you perceive this as becoming more used over time, playing a bigger role in, in our perspective anyway, in the the evolution of uh, an application of good governance, or do you see it kind of going the other way? What's what's next for these? Well, I can say across Canada, the the move has been to consolidate the okay. tribunals so that there are fewer tribunals, but they do more work, and again trying. Once again, specialization, expertise as a decision maker. So that is the trend. And absolutely, I would expect, because the world is getting more complicated, there are more and more issues that are better dealt with by having an evidence-based decision. Mm -hmm. And that is that, that's the key. The decisions we make are not because we like one side or the other. It, what is the evidence that you are presenting? And then applying the law to the facts that, as we hear them. How public is this process? Uh, it's public. It's a public hearing. Okay. Um, you, in the day, you when we had a lot of in-person hearings, you could wander in off the street and sit down it, no problem. In more of the virtual world, you can just simply ask to sign up and you will be included in the audience. So it is a very public process. Even the written hearings, the written hearings, whatever material is before the tribunal is a matter of public record and anybody can go look at it. And that's the point. It should be mm -hmm. a public process. It rules of natural justice. It shall be. Mm -hmm. a public process. Thanks. You're, you're getting me to ask all the hard questions here, Ian, because I was <laughs> going to ask that question, but I'm going to ask this question as well, because I, I, as as the, as a chief, former chief prosecutor, I feel like you're up for any question to be thrown at you. Um, <laughs> there is a misconception out in uh, the world right now, particularly across Canada, that tribunals like yours, like uh, uh, the Land and Property Rights Tribunal, are unelected officials making decisions that are impacting day-to-day -day lives of Canadians, Albertans. How do you how do you how does the tribunal, without getting into the political realm of the issues, sort of change the perception of what you do and how you do it without getting into the weeds? I don't have to. I take my marching orders from the legislation. And who writes the legislation? Not me. <laughs> it's the elected officials who write the legislation. They are the ones who delegate the decision-making powers to us. They are in control. Mm -hmm. And we are servants to that legislation. Does the legislation, sorry, if I may, does the legislation have a requirement for how long the process might take or minute, maximum times or anything like that? Or things just I, unfold as they do? Me, it depends. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a lawyer's answer. On the subdivision, Chris, you'll be aware of the timelines on the subdivision side. It's very tight. Um, and off the top of my head, is it 30 days from the day of the, the appeal being filed to when there's a hearing? And I think it's 30 days from the date of the hearing until the decision. But that's an appeal. And again, I told you there were, there are 40 of those on subdivision side and about the same on the development appeal side. What about the 6,100? What about the 7,000? Um, there are no deadlines for this on the surface right side, but we have targets. The members themselves have come up with what they think is a fair and reasonable time frame in which to have a decision rendered. And the time limit for what we call complex is 120 days. And I'm tremendously proud that we have about, let's say, 2,000 decisions a year 
that would fall into that category. And we have made those targets in all of them. Wow. Now, there are decisions we call precedent setting. These are ones that are gonna have an impact, not just on the case today, but on cases years down the road. For those, I don't want a limit. There shouldn't be a limit. If that is a matter of such importance, there are no limits for those decisions. But the panel sets its own timelines, saying what is reasonable given how important this case is. I know it's it's difficult for somebody from the outside to say, well, why don't you just put a time limit on it like you do for subdivision? It's always driven by the work. What is the file? What is, the, what is important about it? What is the amount of evidence, the examination that needs to be done? The file drives that. Thank you. Now, you're, you are based in uh, Edmonton, if I'm not mistaken. Your offices right. are in Edmonton. The provincial capital is Edmonton. But issues just don't happen in Edmonton. And they happen in Medicine Hat, Brooks, High Level, Fort McMurray. Uh, I know traditionally since uh, past the pandemic, we have moved into a more virtual world where we can have these conversations and these uh, uh, tribunals uh, virtually. But do you have members of the uh, Land and Property Rights Tribunal across this province, or are they traditionally more in Edmonton? And when an issue arises, say, in Brooks, does the tribunal have to go to Brooks and do hearings there, or do they traditionally do them more virtually now? Well, um, yeah, a bunch of questions there. And you're going to say it depends, right? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, I think we have more members in Calgary than we do in Edmonton. Okay. Um, because, again, we had um, we do hearings in Edmonton, we do them in Calgary, we've done them all over the province. It's a question again: what does the file require? With the virtual world, we have found that the virtual hearing actually accommodates more people, makes us more accessible. You are the farmer isn't disadvantaged by the fact that he has to take three days away from his farming operation to make an appearance before it. That farmer now can do his morning milking and come into the hearing. On the other hand, there are litigants, participants for whom the virtual is a wall that cannot be scaled. The, you know, the technology is too difficult. Maybe there's hearing problems. Maybe there's conductivity problems. So what we've come up with, and again, this is enshrined in the rules that we follow. The default position is typically going to be a virtual hearing. And the reason for that is not because anything else other than the volume is so extreme. That's the way we can handle it. We could not handle the volume if we were forced to go back to all in person. On the other hand, if the fairness of the hearing is impacted by the fact that it is virtual, then you listen to both sides and a decision is made. And again, we have certainly done in-person hearings, even in the midst of the pandemic. It was very difficult to arrange for a venue that was big enough that we could have everybody separated by what we had to do and follow all of the rules. But it was important to the fairness of that hearing. And so that's what was done. I have one last question before I let you, we let you go here. And I, I, I want to sort of give you a chance to sort of pitch our listeners, pitch our, our viewers. Why should people applied to be part of the Land and Property Rights Tribunal? Because uh, I I can imagine while you have an abundance of caseloads, as you've mentioned over this uh, uh, course of this last half hour, you probably are still looking for more. So what's the process? Can you give people sort of a link or where they can go to apply? And how long does it usually take for the application process to hear back to say, okay, you're a part of the tribunal now? It's an application just like any other to a government agency. So you cannot apply until there's a competition. And it's of course found on the Alberta government website. So you'll know when a competition is up or not. The process, because 
um, I only make a recommendation as to who would be appointed. This is a decision made by cabinet. So it's in their hands as far as who ultimately is children, because it is you made a question. Who are these people that they are unelected officials? Well, they've been chosen by your elected officials. And that's an important point. I do want to make it really clear, guys. Um, this is not a particular remunerative gig. Um, members don't get paid if they don't work. The average hourly rate is something like $36 an hour. But it's a matter of public service. Your listeners, that's what they do for a living. <laughs> They're in the public service business. And this is what this is. And many of our members are retired or semi-retired. And this is their way of giving back to use their expertise and experience in a way that helps the people who appear before them. I think it's incredibly rewarding. Our members tell me that, that they're incredibly proud that uh, citizens actually put in their hands the dispute that is important to them. And I'm honored and they're honored to be in that position. Susan, I want to take a moment and thank you from both Ian and myself for sitting down for the last half hour and chatting about the quasi-judicial tribunal system, the land and property uh, rights tribunal, and yourself. So thank you so much from the bottom of my heart and from Ian. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs>